Yes, yeah, that's right. And today we're supposed to here to talk about uh, COVID in the lung. And I'd like to talk a little bit, you know, based on the last uh, pres or two presentations ago that you were in about what the lung looks like post COVID and what we can do about it. Um, and a lot of things that you hear about today when people are talking about COVID is talking about vaccines, talking about mitigation strategies, masks, things like that, social distancing, um, and what drugs, we, therapeutics we can use to address the symptoms, uh, but not necessarily what happens, you know, a year from now or two years from now or beyond. And that really intersects well with what I work on. Um, so United Therapeutics is a, uh, a public company. We've been around for about 25 years. Um, and interestingly, we were founded by an entrepreneur who uh, started and founded the first satellite radio company. So Martine Rothblatt um, decided, you know, early in her, on her career, she was interested in space and rockets and communications. So she decided to start putting satellites in the sky to give you uh, hundreds of channels in your car, right? So if you have Sirius XM radio, that was the company that she started. Um, and during the early 90s, when she was doing this company, she, she found out that her daughter uh, had a, a lung disease and so called pulmonary arterial hypertension. And there was no cure. There were no drugs for her daughter at this time. And so Martine quit the satellite business and started a biotech company. And so, uh, you know, Martine pushed really hard and brought uh, a one drug to market for that disease and then two drugs to market for that disease. And now we have five drugs on the market for that singular disease that her daughter takes to this day. Um, and thousands of other uh, people across the world. And that really propelled our company um, forward. And, you know, we keep pushing forward on those drugs, but one of the things that we haven't solved yet is how do you actually cure the disease? And that's where I come in. So our company is uh, putting a lot of our R&D dollars towards actually making organs. And uh, that's really the focus of the talk today is how do we manufacture organs to replace organs that are so damaged that there is no way to repair them with drugs or surgery. And so, you know, when I like to talk about um, increasing, increasing people's health span or increase, giving them a healthier, longer life, um, often people take it from the perspective of, oh, we're gonna give you a drug. Um, I like to take it from a perspective of, well, what do you do to, with your car to keep it around longer, right? You might do an oil change from time to time, but eventually a part is gonna break. And when a part breaks in a car, what do you do? You get it replaced, right? And that's actually the only cure that we have for this particular lung disease is to replace the organ. And today there aren't very many organs available to replace to replace them. So what our goal is to really supply an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. And to put this problem into perspective, um, today there's only about 40,000 organ transplants per year in the US. Um, the waiting list is, you know, it, an order of magnitude higher than that. It's like hundreds of thousands of people. And this, these are old numbers too. And the deaths from people that uh, need organs is in the, the hundreds of thousands of people. So that might be kidney disease, that might be liver disease, all these sorts of different cancers, all the diseases, all of organs combined into one. And these are usually things that can't be solved with taking drugs, right, or surgery. These are things that can only be solved by replacing the whole organ, just like you would in a car. If a piece breaks, it may not be feasible to repair it, so you need to replace it. And this problem is getting worse and worse and worse and worse, especially now with COVID. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that the, basically the doubling of number of people on this waiting list doubles every seven years, right? So a lot of people will talk about technology getting faster and faster and faster, you know, uh, your processor will double increase in density every 18 months, right? Doubles in density every 18 months. In this case, we're seeing an opposite where the transplant waiting list is doubling every seven years. And so it just keeps on growing and growing and growing because the number of transplants in the U.S. is very, very limited. You need to have organs in just the right condition from just the right person at just the right time to get to that patient. And so those numbers are, are relatively constrained and fixed. And so our company is working on everything we can do to increase the number of organ transplants and increase the number of manufactured organs available. And to put this in perspective, the number of people that are waiting for an organ today in the U.S. would fill two of these football fields. If you see this, this is a beautiful Brigham Young uh, football field. But imagine all those people in the U.S. that are waiting today for an organ that they 
may or may not receive. And if they do receive, they're going to receive it, you know, 4 a.m. in the morning. So our company has taken two main approaches. One is something called EVLP. This is essentially where we take organs that surgeons have discarded for transplant. They say, oh, this, this organ's too dirty. We're not going to use it. And we recondition them, rehabilitate it, and then we give it out to someone new. And the other strategy that we have is called regenerative medicine. So this is where we can regenerate organs or create organs from scratch. And we're, I'm gonna talk about both approaches today. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is EVLP. This one is amazing. So those numbers that I was talking about before, you know, there's only about 40,000 organs transplanted in the US per year. About 2000 of those are lungs. And lungs are really special because you know, most people talk about, you know, what's the biggest organ in your body? It's your skin. Well, actually, when you're talking about by surface area, your lung contains basically two tennis courts of surface area inside of it. And because of that, you're always breathing in. It's touching the outside world more than your skin. And this can cause particulates to build up over time. And so when a surgeon re receives an organ for transplant, specifically a lung, they might say, oh, this lung is too dirty or it's got bacteria on it or you know, maybe it's not performing correctly. And so what our company does is we take these organs that other surgeons said, you know, we're not gonna use them for transplant and we wash them, we clean them, and then we give them back out for other people. And this is really, really amazing technology. You, know, you can see this organ on the, the screen right here. I'm not gonna play this video because I've got other things to show you, uh, but essentially we take these organs out, we connect them to a respirator, a ventilator, just like uh, you'd find in a hospital. We perfuse it with a special wash solution. We wash them, we monitor them, we make sure they're working, right? We wanna be really critical and make sure that these organs work. We show surgeons HD videos from the outside, the inside, see, uh, x-rays of them, so that everyone has the clearest picture of these organs. And then when someone accepts it, we ship it out you know, by a helicopter to them. So today, these sort of strategies have already saved you know, thousands of people across the world. And this is really exciting uh, because this is an, a technology that's available today, right? Something that's available today to help increase the number of organs available. But this only increases the numbers of organs available by thousands, right? We're we need hundreds of thousands of organs, right? So this is just the first step. So I talked about the first step, which is taking discarded organs and cleaning them up and sending them out. That'll get us thousands of organs. The question is, how do we get hundreds of thousands of organs? So our company is taking two approaches on that, right? One is we take a pig scaffold approach where we take lungs from pigs and put human cells on them and give those to people. And one is where we actually make the scaffolds ourselves. And I'll get to that part later. So essentially regenerative medicine is the approach here. So how can we use biology to regenerate the body from within or externally and then give to a new a person? And so one approach is what you're seeing here. On the left-hand side, you see a pig scaffold that has all the pig cells washed out of it. So you essentially wash it with soap and you may have uh, held one of these that uh, uh, Army Biofab USA brought to one of the FRC events. Um, you know, I think they brought heart, well, we do lungs. And so essentially you can wash all the pig cells out and on the right-hand side, the red lung, uh, we put human cells back in, and that's what that bioreactor in the center is, is. That's the device that holds these scaffolds as you have this scaffold where it's all protein, no cells. It's like kind of a, a house that has no drywall. You know, it's just like the, just the two by fours, right? And there's nothing in it. Well, we put the cells inside of it, which is the people. And then they say, well, I'm gonna put up a wall here and paint my bathroom green, and I'm gonna put in my kitchen over there. That's what the cells do is they figure out what needs to go where. And uh, so we take the pig scaffolds and put human cells inside of it, let them mature, and then we can eventually give those to people too. So we've got four different projects along this. We've got EVLP, which is reconditioning old organs, Xeno program, which is taking genetically modified pigs and putting those directly into people. We have a uh, regenerative medicine program, which adds the step of adding human cells to that. And sort of the end goal here is to make this more of a manufacturing technology. So when we're talking about manufacturing technology, we're not talking about getting scaffolds or lung scaffolds from pigs from farms. We're talking about making organs ourselves, right? Inside a building, right? No animals involved, right? We just wanna make these scaffolds 
ourselves from scratch. So they're all the same, they're interchangeable, they're, you know, we designed them, right? And so just to put this all in perspective, you know, each of these four technologies exists today. Like this is not some, uh, you know, moonshot, or not even moonshot program. This is not some program that, you know, we're just talking about. This is actually something tangible, physical technology that you can touch and feel and see today and has actually already helped people. So we've had, um, you know, 152 patients in the, you know, as of 2018, that our EVLP system has saved. Our Xeno kidney has supported six months of life in clinic, preclinical models. Our lung lobes um, have also been about 70% recellularized, and our 3D printed organs are very far along. And I'll show you those today. So essentially, the reason, uh, one of the things to think about is two things that we care about. We need hundreds of thousands of organs, so we can't just use organ donations, right? We need to make it a manufacturing technology. And the other side of it is we can't just use pig scaffolds, right? We need to use human cells so that you don't have to take immunosuppressants, right? So it's your own organ. It's not someone else's organ, right? If it's someone else's organ, it's like putting a, a piece from a, like a, a, a Chevy into a, a Honda, right? We, we don't want to like cross those parts. They may work for a time, especially if you take immunosuppressants, but we want to really give you a part that was manufactured for your body, right? That your body recognizes as your own. It's your own cells because that will give us the best quality of life, right? I want millions of these organs, hundreds of thousands and millions of these organs that are made out of your very own cells, right? So it's like your own body may be even better. So how do we do this? Uh, we need about three things. We need to create extremely large uh, 3D printed structures about you know the size of your chest, so uh, uh, very large to fit the lung, and an extremely high resolution, single micron resolution, right? So we'll talk about that later. These also need to be made out of biomaterials, right? Not plastics, not metals like you'd find in cars or traditional 3D printing. We need to make these made out of the same protein that your body is made of, and they need to be strong. And we also need to put your own cells into this. So that's the final part. It needs to be your own cells. Your cells need to be able to go into the scaffold, attach to the wall, see it as home, start proliferating, meaning expanding, creating more of themselves, and start remodeling as they'd like. So what does this look like? In the past, and probably a lot of you have worked with 3D printers, you know, you can print thermoplastics. That's FDM, extrusion technology. Uh, so you're essentially, you know, you're, you're extruding a piece of plastic through a hot nozzle, and you're printing maybe 100 microns, right? And if you're doing bioprinting, as you see in academia, that might be making flat sheets out of hydrogels or maybe even tubes. Well, in order to make an environment that a cell sees as home, it needs to be made out of proteins, as we talked about, not plastic. It needs to be made at single micron resolution, right? Most people are talking about hundreds of microns or millimeters, right? A millimeter is a thousand microns. Your hair like a single strand of hair is 40 microns. And that's about the size of a cell. But in order to build a house for a cell, it needs to be higher resolution than the size of a cell, right? Your, your house for sure has higher resolution than you. you know, you're about you know, six feet tall. Well, the resolution in your house is you know, on the order of inches or when you measure things in the house, it's on the order of inches or smaller, right? So we need to build single micron resolution structures that are the size of your chest. And that's never really been done before. So we went to the best person that we knew of. We went to Chuck Hall. He invented 3D printing in 1986. Uh, he founded the company 3D Systems and they create all fantastical types of metal printing, plastic printing, SLS, nylon, everything that you can think of for aerospace, defense, medical devices, uh, parts for your cars, things like that. And one of the things that Chuck said is, is that the material defines a printer. If you wanna print titanium, you need to go find a printer with a specific wavelength of light to, and heat to melt the titanium, right? And it needs to have argon too, so it doesn't explode. Um, if you wanna print plastic, that's a different process, right? Well, let's apply that to our process. We need to print with protein, right? Because cells define the material and the material defines the printer. And what do cells need? Cells need the exact same thing that your skin's made out of, right? Most of your body is made out of a protein called collagen, specifically type one collagen. And that's what gives your, your skin that sort of, you know, you pull it, it's elastic and then it stops, right? Collagen is like a rope, right? So it works really well in tension. It expands and expands and expands. And then when it hits its max, it's in tension and it stops, right? 
And that's what you see when you pull on your skin. Your skin's made of collagen, your bones are made of collagen. Most of your body, body, all of your organs are made out of collagen. And that's what we need to 3D print with. So where do we get human collagen, right? I don't wanna use pig collagen. I don't wanna use collagen from animals. So what we did is we actually engineered tobacco plants to grow human collagen in their leaves. And this is an example of one of those factories in Texas where we grow these tobacco plants and you can see them. It's a little indoor hydroponics, hydroponic system. These are the tiny little ones. Um, and we let them grow very, very large. And then we take the leaves. We essentially make a smoothie out of it. We press them, extract the juice. And from that, the, that leaf liquid, we can actually extract the human protein. And so all we had to do was add a little bit of uh, human DNA into specific sequences in the uh, tobacco plant, which we understand very well and we can make large amounts of human protein in them for very cheap in a GMP way. So I wanna show you a little bit more about our entire process for making organs and I'll, I'll play this video. And that sort of demonstrates the chain of events from front to back, right? And so we really do want to make this a manufacturing technology that uses your own cells. And so what does that look like? Here's a tiny little test piece that we printed. Uh, this is actually uh, in Israel with our partners who we got the transgenic tobacco plants from. And so we use their tobacco plants to make the human collagen, which we printed right here. And so this is a tiny little segment of your lung you can see this very, very fine vasculature. That vasculature that you see right there, that's about the thickness of a human hair. So if you take a hair off your head and laid it inside, that's how thick that is. This is you know, extremely fine, way more uh, detailed than you'd find in, in any other 3D printer. And that's actually the interesting thing is like, um, when I was working with Chuck Hall, uh, you know, I asked him, you know, can we print uh, at high resolution? He said, of course, just, no one has asked us to do this before. Not that it wasn't possible, that it was just that no one had asked him to do bioprinting at that high resolution at that large size before. And that was actually one of the interesting things is we're not doing anything radically new here. We're just taking pieces that already existed that people had developed for other industries. They had developed in academia, they had developed uh, in the industrial side and no one had ever really connected the dots yet that, oh yeah, 
we can already grow human collagen in tobacco plants. We can already have single micron large volume 3D printers, the highest resolution 3D printers that have ever existed. Uh, we can already take cells from your skin and differentiate them into the lung cell types that we need and grow them into the trillions of cells. And no one had ever put those together before. And that's what we're doing here in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. And so the, the question now is we have a 3D printer, we have the cells, we have the material. Well, what do you actually build? Is there a map to the lung? Is there a CAD file? Uh, the answer is no, there is, there is not a CAD file for the lung, right? And what we really need is a, uh, essentially an STL at the level of single micron um, or below. This, these are 100 or hundreds of nanometers uh, resolution micro CT scan. So we have two CT scanners in house here in Manchester that we use to scan human lungs. And essentially what we do and what you're seeing right now is a 3D model of an actual human lung. Uh, if you would look at a medical textbook, they say it looks like pieces of like a grapevine, right? And these little grapes around the end do the gas exchange, these little alveoli. That's not what it looks like at all. When we slice through it, it looks like a kitchen sponge. It's like essentially a, a open cell uh, foam. And uh, so what we do is we scan the lungs with micro ZT and our mathematician extracts the rule set for a lung. It's a fractal essentially. It's self-similar from the top all the way to the bottom. And I really do mean it is a fractal all the way from top to bottom. Um, and we can discuss that later. Um, and we extract the rule sets for this fractal and then we generate it. It's really cool because we just have to start with the seed conditions. And since it's an L system, you can look this up in Wikipedia, you can start with very simple rules that will generate the whole lung from scratch, right? And these rules you can literally fit on one computer screen and then it generates itself and you get this lung that functions. It's quite amazing. And the way to think about this is your DNA in your body can fit on a CD. So around 700 megabytes, but somehow it has the complexity to generate data sets, which are huge, right? If I tried to scan my whole body with a CT at single micron resolution, it would be thousands of terabytes of information, right? It would be petabytes and petabytes and petabytes. So think about, you know, 10,000 laptop hard drives. That's how much information would be on to scan your body. But your DNA fits just on a CD. And the way it does that is it compresses all that information uh, through these fractal L systems, uh, specifically for the design of the organs or for the ge geometry. And that's really cool. We utilize the same thing. We just have to understand the body and then regenerate from scratch. So what does this look like? Here's Martine on the left. She's the person that founded our company and she's holding one of our uh, lungs from last year. This is a small lobe sized lung and by small, I mean, very large. This was the world's largest lung or hydrogel bioprint. This was the world's largest bioprinted object ever at the highest resolution ever at that time. Um, and we're way beyond this. So all the information and all the images you're seeing today are already public. So I'm gonna share a couple more. I'm really excited to share more, but there's only so much I can share today. Um, this is essentially something that's about uh, the size of a football. There's intricate trachea inside, vasculature all through, and you can actually hook these up to a ventilator, perfuse it with 100% whole blood and actually get gas exchange out of it. Again, these are things that exist today in Manchester, New Hampshire, right? If you go down to the mill yard, we're right there. You can see our lung logo. And these are things that are tangible. Um, these are, you know, earth shots, not moon shots. And so what does the 3D printer look like? I'm sure all of you engineers are, are thinking about that. This is what a demonstration of what our original printer looked like. And this was, uh, you know, world changing at the time. And I can describe it to you as it's going. So essentially this was, this first machine was an SLA. SLA essentially takes a laser beam in the UV range, you know, 365 nanometers. And we filled a vat up with our collagen that we got from the tobacco plants. So this is our bio ink made from tobacco plants. Wherever that laser shoots, it turns into a solid instantly. And from that, we can actually build the top part of the trachea. And that's what you're seeing now is that laser beam is shining across the top and creating <clears throat> the top part of a lung from scratch. And this is how we actually make it a manufacturing technology because we can print these all day. I can make a change to the CAD file and print that next, right? I don't have to wait or depend on an animal to get an organ from, which would all be different, right? No bacon is the same. 
to something that is actually quantifiable and manufacturable. And you can see there, it's coming out of the vat. Oh, it's so cool. It's kind of glistening, but this is a solid, right? Made from human protein. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's essentially how you make a lung from scratch. You get the proteins that you need, you turn it into a bio ink, you use the highest resolution printers ever made, and you print these scaffolds and then you put human cells back into them by flowing it through the airways and flowing it through the vasculature. And so I think I'm about at time here and I've got maybe 10 minutes for questions. Let's see if I got questions. All right, so there's a question here that says, when can I get a kidney printed? Um, so we're working on all organs, but we're starting with the lung. Um, our goal is to have these done not in a decade. Um, our goal is to have these in humans before the end of the decade. So we're actually in animals today uh, doing preclinical work. Um, so this is much closer than you might imagine. You know, it's not science fiction, it's not, um, you know, something you just read about, it's something that it actually does exist. And so we'll be in humans very, uh, uh, very soon. I'm just going into the Whova chat here. All right, well, thank you very much and have a good day.